Hi, it's Todd of Todd's Workshop here, and today we're going to be looking at this, which is a Central European uh, hunting crossbow, 15th century. Uh, 470 pounds in draw weight, and it's a lovely little thing. The Germans did an awful lot of work with uh, ivory, horn, uh, antler, uh, whalebone, and so I've sort of emulated that really. So the whole thing, it's black and white, and it's black and white done in uh, ox horn and camel bone. Um, most likely that would have been horn and ivory back in the day. We've got an antler bolt clip on here. Uh, and then I'll go through some of the sort of notable features of it, really. So if we start at the front here, we've got just a steel hanging ring. And then just here, we've got uh, a bolt bridge, a little cradle to hold the front of the bolt. So the bolt does not sit on the deck. It does not sit in a groove like uh, most military bows are. Now, that helps to reduce friction. Um, it also helps to, to guide the bolt as well. It's just a little bit more reliable, so it makes it a bit more accurate. But the other thing here is you've got this incredible cutout here. Now, I don't know for sure what that's doing there. It's pretty, that much I can see. But uh, what it certainly does do is it reduces the friction as the string comes along the, the stock here. Now, I've done my own empirical testing and I know that if you cant the string very steeply over the stock, so it drags heavily on the stock, you lose about 10% of your energy in that friction. So uh, any losses, any small incremental gains basically along the way is a good thing. So if you can uh, lose less energy through friction, that's good. So actually even later crossbows, the, the whole deck, it still maintained this bolt bridge here, but the whole deck actually could curve down sometimes. So the string in fact touched here and it touched, well, more or less where it's at rest here. But the rest of the time, it wasn't even in contact with the stock at all. Um, so the, that was sort of a target crossbow version, sort of 18th century. And then if we look at the front here again, we've got uh, woven leather braiding here. Serves no purpose at all other than a bit of prettiness. We've got safety cords. Now, historically, bows did break. And you see this in museums all the time, where bows have been replaced. They couldn't be sure of the metallurgy. They couldn't be sure of uh, the heat treatment process that they put it through. So although, of course, empirically the Smiths were very, very good, they couldn't be certain. And that is my belief why the draw lengths on uh, medieval bows are very short. This one here is running at about 140 millimetres, so uh, I think about five and a quarter inches, something like that. You could probably run this bow at six and a half, six and three quarter inches, so 160, 165 mil. That little bit of extra makes a hell of a difference, actually. Uh, so if they could have done, they would have done. So my assumption is that they simply did it for safety's sake. Saying that, bows broke. And you put the cords on here and that just takes some of the sting of the, uh, of the bow out. Um, and bearing in mind your face is the next stop for this, that's obviously quite a good thing. Saying all of that, um, my bows are hardened and tempered in a very controlled way, computer controlled. Um, they will not break. They're, they will bend if they're overdrawn, but they won't break. The string itself is linen. Bindings are hemp, done in the traditional way. Then we have a nut here, and that is lashed on. Now, your gut reaction first, certainly when I started making bows, was that's not going to hold the nut in place. Well, actually, the, the resultant forces, when um, you're basically trying to rotate the nut against the trigger, the resultant forces is to drive the nut down into the socket. So actually, you don't need a hard pin here at all. The, the cord is simply there just to stop the, the nut spinning out uh, during shooting. Um, you can shoot a bow without a cord or without a pin in it at all. The nut will get lost every time. But technically, it's not required to actually shoot the bow. Then we've got two lugs here for a goat's foot lever. I've got a good video on this, actually. Um, so we, we'll post that up. Goat's foot lever cl clips on. And then it allows you to draw the bow back without too much effort, bearing in mind it's 470 pounds. And then we've got a bolt clip. Now, a bolt clip came in around about 1500. So if we say that this bow is 1470 or something, they would not have been there. Um, but the bottom line is this bow is actually going for hunting, you know, real, real time hunting um, over in the US. And I figured that the guy is going to appreciate when he's, you know, hiding in bushes and walking through the woods and so on. He's going to appreciate having a bolt, which is exactly where he, it was where he last put it. Um, and then just the stock itself. Uh, the stock is cherry. 
the white is bone, uh, the black is horn. Now, this has been supplied with three bolts. These are standard sort of feather fletch bolts that I supply uh, with any of my bows. Um, ash shaft, uh, around about 350 mil, 14 inches long. Steel, modern bodkin, mod bod head on the end. Um, work very nicely, easy to get out of targets. The fella has also uh, asked for a couple of blunts. So these are wooden blunts with a steel pin in the end, again on an ash shaft. Um, obviously these don't penetrate, but for small game, they will smack the hell out of it. Uh, so again, they're good. And then these last ones are hand-forged arrowheads by a chap called Will Sherman, UK arrowsmith. Um, what I would also like to say, I haven't actually mentioned it to Will, but what I'd like to say is that the sockets are particularly good. And you might think that that's kind of irrelevant, but actually, when you're forming an arrow, arrow socket, you've got one piece of metal goes over the other so that you get a, a cone, proper cone. It doesn't have a split up the side. Now, what that means is inherently you have a socket which is not conical in form inside. That's its sort of natural state. Uh, and what that means is that it's actually very difficult to get the arrowhead straight onto a shaft. It's, um, they're either canted off or, or they come down to one side or the other. Um, now, on a wide head like this, which does tend to plane through the air, that's really quite important because if, if the head is not set accurately, the shaft will not um, fly true, it'll, it'll curve. On an arrow shaft, it's not so important, actually, because you've got uh, a long distance with the fletchings at the back. On a bolt, it is much more important. It's much more critical that the head is good. And uh, the sockets on his heads are really tight and really accurately formed um, so that they stay parallel to the shaft, which is actually parallel, which is, of course, what you want. And then there's a tiny little copper pin, and that's just to retain uh, the, shaft onto, uh, the head onto the shaft. These take a lot of load when they smack. If that hits a bit of bone as it's going through, it's going to do that. And, you know, the heads can and will detach. It's just the nature of it. Um, so the pin helps, helps to, to keep the thing, two things together. Doesn't guarantee it at all by any means. So let's go and shoot the thing and see what it is. So first off, I'm going to shoot the blunt and we'll get a, a speed reading off that. Now, again, there's a, a good video on how to load these things. But you want the nut to be in the forward position because it's actually the goat's foot pulling the string back which turns the nut and locks the whole system. And the bolt clip also, which is a little bit fragile, that needs to be out of the way. Um, so, let's load the thing up. As I said, 470 pounds. So, we're in. You now move the clip into the right position. Hook the end of the bolt under it, and you can see now it's it's all nicely held. And let's see if we can get a reading. 143.9, so let's just zoom in there. So we shot the blunt at uh, the target here. I've actually put the sheepskin on it just to try and take some of the, the smack out of it. Uh, when it lands because, you know, that's a hard thing for a large blunt to hit. Have a look at the back of this though. Those are old holes. Oh no, that's the one. Nice round hole. So that's actually the blunt piercing um, the sheepskin there and all the wool. So you get an idea from that how much of a, a mess it would make of a small creature like a rabbit or a pigeon. Uh, that said, it is 48 joules in energy. It's a 50 gram bolt. Uh, it's 48 joules in energy, or 35 foot-pounds if you're US. Uh, that's on the, on the blunt. So we'll have a look at the um, sharps now, and we'll see where we get to with that. So, what I've got first of all is this. It is a stack of cardboard and thin plywood. The reason for that is... Obviously, I don't want to stick my broadheads into this straw boss because it will chew up the brass boss and it will be held to get the blunts out, uh, the broadheads out. But then the other thing is uh, that any bolt does not like hitting something really hard like a tree or something like that. They just don't like it. So this one, because of the way it's layered and so on, it just softens the entry of the bolt a little bit rather than whacking into something dead hard. 
Uh, that said, it goes in, and if it does penetrate deeply, these, these sharps won't, I've done a couple of tests, but if it does penetrate deeply, you can then basically take the whole thing apart piece by piece and get the bolt out that way. So I always test broadheads against layered cardboard or cardboard layered with thin ply, that sort of thing. So let's uh, load up and shoot up. Just going to get the bow ready, so we're going to move the bolt clip out the way, get the nut into the right position. And then I always just put the, the butt of the bow just against the top of my leg there, and on the front, and draw back. <coughs> Trigger's engaged. Bolt clip moves in, and just hook the end of it there. So, let's see what we get. It does kick some, this one as well, actually. Um, it's a powerful little bow. So let's zoom in. That was 140 feet per second. See onto the bolt or the reading. No, it's too dark for the reading, but anyway, there we are with the bolt. Now, I will just show you a little bit about extracting the bolt as well. Now, the broadhead here, uh, it has come in at that angle. So basically, you find the orientation of the blade and you rock the bolt in the orientation of the blade, pulling a little bit, not a lot. Do not grab the shaft. If you grab the shaft, you'll end up breaking the bolt. You really will. So, a bit of a slow process. Just easing it out. There we are. And now we've got the bolt out. So that's our, our broadhead, and we'll do a quick sum, find out what the energy is. I've weighed up and calculated the energies on the barbed hunting bolt. So that weighs in at 57 grams. It gives an energy of 53 joules or 39 foot pounds. Uh, the actual distance across it, just for those who know, it looks to be about 30 millimeters, inch and a quarter, something like that. Thank you very much. We're going to do some long shooting now so you can have a bit of a look. And, uh, and there we have it, really. Central European 15th century hunting crossbow. 470 pound draw bait. Thank you. Right, so we do a bit more long shooting. This is about 15 yards, something like that. Uh, and again, there's good videos on, on how to load goat's foot bows. It's not overly difficult. So sprinkle it back into position. Here we go. A little high and right. So the rate of shooting is pretty good, actually. Uh, and bolt clips back in. Like I said, you've got to be a little bit delicate with them. High, just above centre. So I'll see if I can get this one pretty much on centre. Just a little three inches right. So we'll have a look at that grouping. So like I say, it's about 15 yards. So I'd guess it's about 150 mil, six inch, something like that. Uh, no sights, obviously. <laughs> 